Bibles for the reading of God's Word that we will also hear the preaching of. This evening we turn to 1 Corinthians 15, and it will be wonderful to read the whole chapter dealing with the resurrection, but we will focus on that last part, beginning in verse 50, where Paul is finishing up that hope that is in the victory of the resurrection. If you're able to ask, you would stand for the reading of God's word. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So in this corruptible let's put on incorruption, and this mortal let's put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brethren, beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to us. Please be seated. Paul in this chapter has been writing about the resurrection. Some in the church of Corinth were suggesting that the resurrection was already past. And Paul deals with that. He carefully reasons of that resurrection that is begun in Jesus Christ, that is the reality and the cornerstone of the Christian faith. For if Christ is not raised, Paul says, our faith is futile. Who may have hope in a crucified Savior who has remained under the power of death. But Christ is risen, and therefore there is hope. And Paul deals with that manner of the resurrection. There are questions people have about it. What will it be like? What will our bodies be like? And he, he says, it will be glorious. And we do not yet know, we do not yet experience what that will be. But there is that hope and that confidence. And as Paul now brings to a conclusion, he brings us to that completeness of the victory of Jesus that is ours through faith in him. And so we want to think this evening about that victory, that in one sense it is a complete victory, and yet in another sense it is an anticipated victory. For we have the benefits of Christ already now in principle, but in the resurrection, we will have them in fullness. But all of that is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as Paul begins to reason, as he sets before us his hope, the completeness of that victory he first shows why it is necessary. There is a necessary change in our very nature. And why is that? Well, he writes, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And why is that? What is he speaking about? When Paul writes about flesh and blood, he is talking about our human nature. And we know that it has not been the sinful nature refers to, first of all, because Jesus Christ took on our nature. He took on flesh and blood without sin. But here 
Paul is saying that that very nature that we have cannot and is not suited to receive the kingdom of heaven. And why is that? Well, the kingdom of heaven is an everlasting kingdom. And we know that our flesh and blood is mortal. We die. And therefore there must be a change of it. And we know that our human nature, our flesh and blood is not yet purged of every sin. That there is yet that remnant of sin that we fight against, that we experience every day. And therefore, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, for it is perfect in its righteousness, in its holiness. But we are not suited. And therefore, a change is necessary. For it cannot bear the weight of glory. And Paul demonstrates, he shows, corruption cannot inherit incorruption. And you think, well, that makes sense. <laughs> that which is corruptible, that which decays, that which rusts, that which and, and goes through a process and wears out. It is not suitable for that which must continue forever. The incorruption and Paul then says, I tell you a mystery. And a mystery in the New Testament is something that is revealed that was hidden in times past. And Paul says, I declare this now to you. We shall not all sleep. And here, sleep is, uh, we might say, a euphemism is another way of expressing death. We shall not all die. And here Paul says, we shall all be changed. Paul is, is talking about that change for those who are alive as well as for those who have already died. And here is speaking of those who will be alive at the coming of Christ. For if they come, their nature is still unsuited, for it is still corruptible, it is still mortal, and it must be changed. And Paul says, here is the truth that I now reveal to you. Those who do not die before the coming of Christ shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, this will be that instantaneous change so that what was corruptible and mortal becomes incorruptible and immortal, that which is necessary to enjoy the kingdom of God that is an everlasting kingdom. For if we are to live forever, if we are to enjoy the absolute and immediate presence of a holy God, our nature must be entirely sanctified and our bodies must be able to continue forever to enjoy this God who has made us for himself. And therefore those who remain at the coming of Christ will be changed and given that glorious body. But it's not only those who are alive at the time of Christ, but all of God's people will be changed. And so he deals with with the others. At the last trumpet, yes, those who are alive will be changed, but also that the dead will be raised incorruptible. They will be raised into this new nature that all who believe in Jesus Christ will have this incorruptible nature and will have this immortality. They will be perfectly suited for the glories of heaven and to rejoice and to live their lives and to do all their work and their praise of God forever and ever and will be suited in that glorious nature. <coughs> now we know that unbelievers as well will be raised. 
for they will be raised to a judgment. They too will have bodies and souls that will continue forever, but they will suffer God's righteous judgment. But here Paul is speaking of the hope of believers, that we may long for and look for that resurrection. And this, this change, was already anticipated in the Old Testament. So in one sense, there is that mystery that Paul speaks about for those who will be alive at the coming of Christ, but that understanding of the resurrection and of that change is something that was already anticipated, hinted at in the Old Testament. And we saw something of that this morning. We are reminded in Isaiah 25, verse 8, he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people will be taken away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. There will be the hope of God's people. And you can see there there is already that pointing toward that rejoicing, that glory, that hope that God will wipe away tears from all faces. That is picked up in the book of Revelation where there will be no more crying, no more tears, but that God will be their God. We think again of Hosea 13, verse 14, where Hosea the prophet speaking the word of God, speaking for God, says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction." Here is God saying, this is what he will accomplish. And Paul then reminds them, as he he brings this chapter to a summary, of the certainty of this hope. This glorious change that, that was known vaguely in the Old Testament, but now has been fully revealed in Jesus Christ. For it was Jesus Christ who was raised incorruptible in his human nature. See, Jesus taking on our nature was made corruptible and mortal. We know that because Jesus suffered. Jesus died in our nature. But when he was raised, the power of God that raised him first raised Jesus Christ, incorruptible, immortal in his human nature. We know in his divine nature he never changed, that he remained the same yesterday, today, and forever. But in his human nature there was that glorious change in his resurrection. And Jesus is that promise of our resurrection. And here We remember that that Paul is speaking after years of the church's reflection of the fullness of the promises of God in Jesus Christ. This morning we looked at that immediacy of the resurrection, the fact of that resurrection, and how Jesus' teaching was now fulfilled, how it gave hope. And, And here Paul, after years and after the attacks that came even against the resurrection, some saying the resurrection was past, or there was no resurrection, Paul says, no, think, reflect, reason, and see that here indeed is our glorious hope. And it is because we are united to Jesus Christ. And here is that mystery of faith. That as we are united to Jesus Christ, what is true of him is true of us. This is glorious. When we think of the results, Romans 8 verse 11 says, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. This is that hope. Here is that reality. 
And in Colossians, there is that focus on the unity, the union with Christ. Colossians 2, verse 11. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. It was not something physical. It was the work of the Spirit. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You see here the cutting off of sin. And therefore buried with him in baptism. You see this language of union? What is true of Christ is true of me. I was buried with Christ. Because my baptism is that identification with Jesus. But it doesn't end there, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And therefore, what is true of Jesus, his death is my death, his resurrection is my resurrection. And there is the hope, there is what is so glorious. And we say, how does that work? And the answer of scripture it is your faith that unites you to Jesus Christ in this glorious way. And you begin to understand that if we would deny to Jesus a resurrection, what are we left with? A hope of this life? Paul says that is no hope. But it is in Jesus we find our certain hope of the resurrection. And you look at Paul's reasoning again. As he looks in the Old Testament, death is swallowed up in victory. It is no more. It does not have the power. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, oh, grave, where is your victory? And then he reminds us, he leads us through this reasoning to show us the glory of our hope. The sting of death is sin. Where is it that we find that sting? It is in sin. It is sin that gives us that wound that causes every person apart from the grace of God to die under judgment. And the strength of sin is the law. Sin is revealed, is made clear as God writes the law and the Ten Commandments, as God writes the law in the hearts of men. It is the law that gives strength to sin because here is the commandment. <laughs> And we read it, and Paul writes about the law, though it is good and just, the wickedness of sin twists it, and those things the law says don't do, we're drawn to. We see it in our children. We see it in ourselves. If it ended there, there would be no hope. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us that victory, not something independent that we have no part in, for we are part of Christ. And his obedience is our obedience. His death is our death, and his resurrection is our resurrection. And there is the marvel and that's why Paul says, thanks be to God. He deserves all the praise and glory and adoration. And it is through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord, for it is God in the flesh. It is Jesus, that name given to that child born, that reference to his real human nature, and the Christ, the Messiah, the one sent from heaven, that he might be our Redeemer. 
And so there he is, we'd say that complete victory. And yet sometimes we don't feel that victory. And there is the reality of an anticipated victory. But we still know the struggle against sin. We know the losses against temptation. We know the accusations of a conscience that says you have done wrong. And there is an anticipated <coughs> victory when we will be raised incorruptible, when we will no longer have bodies that are subject to the ravages of the curse against sin, because we will be perfected in Christ Jesus. And therefore we are waiting for the coming of Jesus. And we see that as Paul thinks about the coming of Christ. Here is what we are waiting for. When Christ comes, when all will be changed, those who are alive will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And those who are dead will be raised with that same incorruptible nature. And we wait for that. And earlier in their chapter, Paul has spoken of that as well. When he speaks that it was Christ who was the first fruits. Christ who was the first to be made alive. Verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. And therefore, the work of Christ is completed, and yet our full participation in it, the fullness of that glory, waits for Jesus coming again. But note how Paul says this is something that is going to affect your life. This knowledge, this reality, and in verse 58, this is where he says, this is how it applies to you. Here, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Think of what Paul is saying. Be steadfast, immovable. If this is your hope, if this is the reality that you are certain of, we may stand our ground. And those who would deny the resurrection, we don't have our faith shaken by that. We say, I know that my Savior has been raised, that I am joined in by faith, and I will experience that change to immortality, to incorruption, Notice as well, it is something lived out. It is not just a hope for the future. Someday I'll experience it. I'll cash in on it. But notice how he says, abounding in the work of the Lord. You see, it is the conviction of Scripture and of most theologians that heaven is not going to be a place where you are sitting on a cloud strumming a harp singing forever and ever. We will be involved in work that glorifies God. And therefore, because by faith we already experience and we already know that newness of life, we are to be abounding now in the work of the Lord, that we do all things to his glory consciously, because of our hope in the resurrection that our work is not in vain in the Lord. The Lord gives it to us. He gives us opportunities and we develop it to the praise of God and it will be remembered through all eternity. And we think here is grace upon grace. God gives us a grace. He saves us. He gives us work to do and then he rewards us for the Work that we do by the power of his grace. And you say, here is a God abounding in loving kindness. Whose grace is unfathomable. That he would do this for sinners. And how we marvel. 
And we say, this is going to define my life. I am going to live in that hope of the resurrection. I am going to live out of the reality that what Christ has done is counted for me. That I would seek his kingdom. That every thought is to be brought captive. I am to examine every part of my life and say, am I ordering my life to please God? Am I pursuing those things, my labor, that is not in vain? Am I abounding in the work of the Lord? You see, this is where Paul says, the place where we might say the rubber meets the road. We can talk about some resurrection, some hope, some glory way down the line. But Paul says the believer is united to Christ now and it defines our lives. And so we may live confidently and hopefully in this life knowing that as long as the Lord gives us life and opportunity, we are to be busy seeking his will for our lives, living to praise and glorify him. There is that glorious confidence because sin has been dealt its mortal blow. And even our death physically is our entrance into glory. To wait to be raised incorruptible. And so yes, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But Paul's desire was to be whole, body and soul in the presence of God that would wait for that glorious resurrection. And so we are reminded the victory is complete. Christ has gained it. And as we are in him, it is our victory. And we live out that victory already in our lives, but we know that the full realization will come when Christ returns. On the clouds in glory, with his reward for those who have believed in him. And there is why the church can endure all persecution, all the attacks of the enemy. This is why believers can be faithful in the midst of difficulty, hardship, and endure even martyrdom because they know that men do not define them, but their hope, their confidence is in that glorious life and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as we think on that, as we meditate on that, then we may grow in our confidence and say, regardless of what men say, regardless of what men do, here is the reality in which I live and in which I die and in which I will live forever. May that be your comfort and your hope. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we think of how the Apostle Paul reflects on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For Lord, we think of the first recipients of that news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how they were confused, how they were not sure what to make of it. And they knew the fact that Jesus was alive again, but they did not understand the fullness of it. We think how you, by your Spirit, led to a fuller understanding of that glorious truth that Paul could give that wonderful, powerful, systematic exposition that would end considering the completeness of that victory that is necessary for us to be changed, that we might be able to bear within ourselves the weight of glory. Oh, Father, we pray that the reality of that may be understood by faith, 
that our union with Christ may grow and increase and that we may therefore live faithfully, abounding in the work of the Lord. O Lord, bless us in that, that you may be glorified in us. We pray in Jesus. Amen.